In the year 1990, Squaresoft released Final Fantasy III, which proved another step in the evolution of the fledgling JRPG subgenre, and yet another pivot in experimental game design by Hironobu Sakaguchi and his Motley A-Team. Though released at the end of the Nintendo Entertainment System console cycle, and not reaching Western audiences until 2006, Final Fantasy III was, in many respects, a game-changer for the series, the moment that Squaresoft found its stride as RPG developers and established a blueprint of game mechanics that shifted the way RPGs would be made for a generation. The earliest Final Fantasy games, as recently discussed with my Final Fantasy 1 and 2 episodes, were an exercise in emulation and experimentation. Little secret has been made of the influences drawn from Enix's Dragon Quest and earlier RPGs such as Wizardry and Ultima in the development of the first two Final Fantasy games. However, Final Fantasy III was a bold step towards what would become a uniquely Final Fantasy experience, and where Final Fantasy II introduced important cosmetic elements such as chocobos, a character called Sid, and set hero identities, it was Final Fantasy III that challenged the prevailing levelling and class systems that computer games had inherited from their tabletop predecessors, and while it was not as narratively ambitious as its predecessor, it proved a spectacle of how RPG gameplay could be advanced towards a more empowering, player-determinate means of play. Now, while Final Fantasy III did push the envelope in many ways, there were some aspects of the game that seemed to regress somewhat on the emerging Final Fantasy formula. For example, where Final Fantasy II had debuted defined heroes with Firion, Maria and Guy, Final Fantasy III made a return to the nameless Warriors of Light as central protagonists, and in doing so, stripped away the hero identities and the potential for personal stories and character arcs which have since become integral to the series and Final Fantasy III relied instead on guest characters and external events to comprise its emotive scenarios and propel the story forwards. The Nintendo DS remake and Western release of Final Fantasy III in 2006 sought to remedy this narrative decision by repackaging the central party as named entities, Lunath, Ark, Refia, and Ingus, and with these defined identities applied to the characters, along with humorously distinct personalities, the Final Fantasy III of 2006 might reasonably be considered an entirely different experience to the original 1990 game, highlighting the changes in priorities, technology, and player expectations of a Final Fantasy game over time. And while purists who celebrate the difficulty and grind of early RPGs might particularly enjoy the ruthlessness of Final Fantasy III. They might conversely perhaps consider the 2006 remake a lightweight dilution of the original title, and conversely, those who celebrate the story and character arcs of more modern Final Fantasy games may find it a much more relatable title with the subtle reworking of the story and the introduction of named protagonists as a stronger incentive to play than necessarily the mechanics and the strategy and the grind of the gameplay itself. Now, looking at the setting and themes, Final Fantasy III not only nods back to the first game with the reintroduction of an ambiguous quartet of light warriors, but so too with the reintroduction of elemental crystals, the concept of light versus dark, and a magical antagonist who endangers this worldly equilibrium, which forms the backbone of the game's narrative premise. Looking at the context of the time, it's possible that these recycled plot elements from Sakaguchi's first game were as much to do with time pressure as they were to do with establishing an aesthetic formula for the Final Fantasy brand. Because being published immediately prior to the Super Nintendo release meant that much more of Squaresoft's development team were focused on upskilling and acclimatizing to next generation technology which is also partly the reason why a western port of Final Fantasy III was delayed and subsequently abandoned uh, for over a decade. So, ultimately, the game was an exercise in pushing mechanics and gameplay formulas before moving on to the next console cycle, and it is notable that the capacity of the Nintendo game cartridges 
was pushed to the absolute limit to include all of Final Fantasy III's content and features, such was the desire to push the envelope with all the mechanics and features possible, preparing the team for the next generation of RPG. So, the real heart of Final Fantasy III resides in its gameplay. The experience hinges on the freedom to customise and engage with the hero party as strategic battle assets, rather than their involvement in an expansive personal story. And to this day, every review or discourse concerning Final Fantasy III will note on the introduction of the customizable job class system as its defining feature, rather than anything particular to the game's world, characters or story. So let's take a moment now to consider what the job class system actually did. Why was it so novel for players? And why did it help, perhaps, that our heroes returned to the generic form of Avatar rather than having their own personalities and identities? Well, assigning a designated class to a character, such as a mage, or a fighter, or a monk, and so on, it offers pre-designated abilities and attributes that define our character and avatar in the game world, and particularly in the battle screen, and it permits them to build up and develop a unique skill set as they progress through the game. The character class bridges the player with the lore and the story, and each subsequent playthrough is unique, insofar as players are allowed to change their class on each new game. Later Final Fantasies, such as Final Fantasy IV, gave the hero characters fixed classes to highlight their uniqueness and their individual personalities within the story, as well as their character arcs and, and the things that happened to them. So Cecil's transition to a paladin from a Dark Knight was a pivotal aspect of the story, for example, that changed his attributes and his class in battle. Final Fantasy III, however, was unique for the time because character classes and, and job classes were adaptable to circumstance, and the ability to switch and strategize character builds was integral to a player's progression through the game story, owing to the uniquely challenging and ruthlessly successive battles that take place as the adventure progresses. So therefore, a, a battle against enemies with high defense but a weakness against a certain element might encourage players to apply spell wielders to their party for the duration of that battle, rather than rely on melee job classes, which would have nominal damage in this particular circumstance. So that's an example of how the malleable job classes played out. Beyond this approach to gameplay, Final Fantasy III was the first to include unique commands such as jump and summon to particular character classes, so aside from mere statistical presets, value was added to jobs that would enable players to overcome enemies in unique and interesting ways. The class commands established in Final Fantasy III would in fact go on to become definitive aspects of character development in later games, with most installments, excusing Final Fantasies 7, 8 and 12, featuring characters that had defined specific attributes, and were indeed in many cases defined by their attributes, with the summoner class in particular becoming an increasing centerpiece of Final Fantasy stories, with Yuna in Final Fantasy X, Noctis in Final Fantasy XV, and the dominance of Final Fantasy XVI. So while the gameplay of Final Fantasy III makes up for a deficit in its story, that is not to suggest that it, it has no story, and indeed the approach to narrative design and its recycling of elements that were used in the first two titles are important to acknowledge because it charts how Final Fantasy as an experience was crafted over time and the themes and expectations that players would familiarise with despite the different worlds, characters and stories of each game would come to regard as distinctly Final Fantasy. The narrative premise of A World in Crisis of elemental crystals determining the balance between light and dark, and a young fellowship of adventurers venturing to restore balance against an evil tyranny is quintessential of not just Final Fantasy III, but of the series as a whole in a lot of ways. And ancillary elements such as the Ancients being an archaic but technologically superior race who existed in the world of Final Fantasy III long before the events of the game take place is something that also became a formula of Final Fantasy as the series wore on, with the Ancients of Final Fantasy VII, the Centra of Final Fantasy VIII, 
and the machina-wielding denizens of old Zanakand in Final Fantasy X being prime examples of this world-building device that's used to flesh out the worlds and histories uh, of a given Final Fantasy. The introduction of ancient beings serves as both a world-building device to enhance the setting and to communicate thematic plot points essential to the Final Fantasy experience, often in the form of the antagonist's impact on the world and mankind's relationship between nature and technology. In both Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy X, for example, the Ancients are wiped out by Genova and Sin, respectively. In both instances, the cataclysmic act is later explored by or blamed upon technology. And it was much the same in Final Fantasy III that these concepts first emerged and were established and were actually conflated insofar as the Ancients were were concerned, for it was them that brought destruction upon the world by harnessing the crystals to advance society through technology, inadvertently causing the flood of light cataclysm that brought the world into ruin. So this is a plot point that recalls the cautionary tales found in Greek myth uh, with Icarus flying too close to the sun, Prometheus stealing the fire from the gods and so on, and where both of these tragic Greek protagonists were punished for trying to defy natural orders, so too were the ancients of Final Fantasy III shamed by their inquisitive pride, and the warriors of light enter the fray to restore balance to the world. The narrative formula of Final Fantasy III and its dispute between nature and technology is a recurring motif used by Hironobu Sakaguchi in his work, and it's perhaps a reflection of the transformative society that he grew up in, a Japan that was booming from technological innovations through the latter 20th century that was divorcing the country from its deep-rooted Shinto-inflected observances of the natural world and indeed harming the natural world around Japan. But regardless of the origins of this theme, it is a decisive thread of Final Fantasy III's backstory that would feature recurringly throughout future games, even once Sakaguchi himself had left Squaresoft. That being said, like the two Final Fantasy games that preceded it, and indeed the two that followed, Final Fantasy III maintained a predominantly Western fantasy setting by featuring knights, castles, and quaint thatched villages that recalled ideas of provincial Europe during the Dark Ages. The inclusion of Vikings is further evidence of Square's inspirational free-for-all uh, and drawing from the well of Western history far back into the Age of Exploration. So, wrapping up here, the lasting legacy of Final Fantasy III is undoubtedly gameplay and the innovations it brought to bear on how to navigate and strategize and grind in the early JRPG era. A story rose to prominence over the years, most furtively, with Final Fantasy III's follow-up in Final Fantasy IV, which coincided with difficulty and grind gradually ebbing away from Final Fantasy games as time wore on, becoming more of an optional completionist tangent for players, with Emerald, Ultimate and Amiga weapons pocketing various Final Fantasy games as optional challenges, Final Fantasy III's legacy and repute today is something of an edge case and a niche for those invested more thoroughly in difficulty and, and, and grinding games. So in all, I think Final Fantasy III is very much the middle child of Final Fantasy history. It brought several innovations to bear in the arena of both gameplay and narrative structure, but the combined effects of its Japan-only release, arriving at the end of a console cycle, its unforgiving difficulty, and its prioritization of gameplay over story have perhaps distanced it from the expectations of a modern audience. And that said, we are in some respects spoilt for choice if we choose to return to this game today, because we not only have the 2006 3D remake, which is more palatable to story-centric fans, but for traditionalists and grinders, uh, and those that are up for a more challenging gameplay, the more recent pixel remaster, being the most recent port, nods more faithfully back to the release found in 1990, and stands up today as probably the most faithful tribute to Square's early period of games development. 